So I just came home um, from going to the, the shop to get some Blu-rays and um, I came back and everything was dark. Like I, I'm pretty sure I left in the middle of the day and everything was dark and um, the fireplace was on, which is weird because it, it doesn't really work, but suddenly it was on when I got in and I found this book on the mantelpiece, Handbook for the Recently Deceased. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm flicking through it and I'm just, I'm not really making much sense of it. So I guess what I should do is give you a video of conquering my collection and talking about the film Beetlejuice. But I'll try not to say that more than one more time because then things will get really hairy. So this is a film from my childhood, personally, that I absolutely loved. I think my mum showed this to me. I need to check that with her, actually. And I thought I'd just quickly throw this in there as a bonus clip of sorts. After filming this video, about a week later, I saw my mum and I asked her, did you show me Beetlejuice when I was a kid? And she said, yeah, why? And I said, well, I wasn't sure if you'd shown it to me when I was like really young and if you'd introduced me to it and so on. She said, yeah, you loved it. You were scared senseless, but you loved it. So I thought that was a cool little story that I'd throw into the video for a little bit of um, an extra bonus clip. And I don't know where I'm going to edit it into the video. So there it is. That's, that's the story. I'm pretty sure she really likes this film. But either way, it's a film from my childhood and I got the 4K release of it from HMV and I really wanted to watch it pretty much as soon as possible I have to say it was one of those films where um, I was intrigued to see how it would look in 4k but I really just wanted to revisit it as a film I can't remember the last time I actually sat down and watched it properly so Beetlejuice um, shit I can't say it again um, Beetlegeist I didn't really get that because in the film it, it's Beetlejuice but spelt Beetlegeist and then they just called it Beetlejuice for the film title which I guess is more legible I don't know it's a weird thing. I'd like to know the the, the re reasoning behind that. But um, so this is one I, I just I wanted to watch pretty soon. And I should say now, because this is the first film, I think, in Conquering My Collection that I'm talking about that I have already seen. This series was started in mind for me to watch Blu-rays in my collection of films I hadn't seen. But I, I want to expand that so I can talk about different films, films I haven't that I have seen but I haven't seen for a while. Um, but if I haven't seen it in blue in Blu-ray format before, or in this case 4K format before, and I don't think I have seen this on Blu-ray. I have it in the Tim Burton box set, but I'm not sure. But it's a new format, and so for me it's it's worthy of talking about the experience of seeing it in the new format, but also just seeing it again, because opinions do change and, and they strengthen and they weaken over time. It depends on the film, it depends on where you are when you're watching it. So Revisiting this film, uh, what did I think? <sighs> well, I can safely say, I mean, it was pretty much there already, but this is definitely like an all-time favorite film for me. I couldn't see this not being in my top 100 favorite films of all time. I'll say that much. I love this film so much. I, I'd forgotten that it was really like only like an hour and a half. It's really brisk. It wastes no time, and it gets it gets started straight away. I love the opening credit sequence. It's the 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 score. See, my brain kind of the, the 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 score is so fantastic Danny Elfman it's just such a unique score and there's so so many layers to it like the opening is like creepy but kind of exciting and kind of jaunty and very fitting to the character I think um but there there's these haunting pieces even as a kid I was so like I was mesmerized by the visuals of what I was seeing but also really like um, captivated by the way the music brought so much mood and atmosphere to the story and the the, the visuals that are already providing a great mood and atmosphere. Um, the scene when, um, I forget the characters' names, I really just, um, <laughs> the yuppie couple, um, Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin. Um, again, one of my favorite films and I, I don't know the characters' name. Lydia, I can, I can tell you that much in terms of Winona Ryder's character and Otho because Otho is such a distinctive name but I couldn't tell you the names of... Uh, uh, you know, Lydia's parents, or even Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis. And it's always strange to me that this Alec Baldwin in this film, because he just looks so much different than he does now, and, and has done for the past 20 years or so. And then, of course, there's Michael Keaton as Beetlejuice, and uh, Sylvia Sidney as, um, is it Juno? I think? The, uh, Juno, your caseworker. Um, Syl Sylvia Sidney, I mean, what a legend, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, going back to, like, the 30s, and working with Hitchcock and on Sabotage, which is a great film. Um, yeah, legend. Anyway, so where, where was I going with this? So the score. Yeah, so when um, Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin, they, they go to the other side and they walk through this corridor and oh, the music. Oh, my God, it's so good. 
and they open this door, or I think it's like a, a blind that goes up, and it's just this black room with these like these spirits kind of like they all face sunken and stuff and the music is so haunting and this guy turns up and explains that the, these are people who this is where like certain spirits go when they die this is like this is being dead for the dead and it just feels like i just remember as a kid that imagery of the the floating ghost was so creepy and unsettling and the music just fully supports that uh, and then like the sequence when otho resurrects you know alec baldwin and gina davis and then with the the bridal wedding clothes and they they kind of like they, they rise up and their bodies fill the clothes and at first it's their normal you know kind of features and stuff but then they start to age and their, their face starts falling off and the music is like oh so grand and you know again affecting this is something about the score in this that i, I absolutely adore and i have seen that there's a, a music only track on here i don't know if it's on the 4k or the Blu-ray, but I, I, I need to listen to that because I adore the soundtrack and I feel like it's such a character in the film. And speaking of a character in the film, there's no Beetlejuice without Beetlejuice, right? Michael Keaton, um, and I, I think that's the last time I watched the film, was during my Michael Keaton Month series in 2013. Still remains one of my favorite things I've done on my channel. I, I reviewed every film Michael Keaton had ever appeared in up until that point in 2013, which is very timely because in 2014, he experienced a big resurgence in his career with films like Birdman, Spotlight, and so on. Welcome to day seven of Michael Keaton Month, where I'll be reviewing all the movies Michael Keaton has appeared in. And today, Connie is joining me to talk about the movie because uh, she loves it just as much as I do. And it's one of Michael Keaton's most iconic roles, in my opinion, and it is Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice! Yeah, just don't say it again, because if you say it three times, he tends to turn up and make things a bit weird, so what? we don't want that. Beetlejuice. Oh wait, no, we're good. <laughs> we're good. Panic me for a second then, because if you say it three times, but you only say it twice, so you, know, you have to say it three times individually, I think, for it to actually count. So we're good, as long as you don't say Beetlejuice again, we are fine. So the movie itself... Beetle! Don't say Beetlejuice again. <laughs> the movie is about... Um... You just said it. Oh boy, you guys are really a couple of spooksters, aren't you? <laughs> now, let's turn on the juice and see what shakes loose. What the fuck? What? I said if you'd say his name three times, he'd turn up. I, mean, I did not say three times, you did. Well, I did, but I didn't mean to. Where's this model village come from? When, when did we have this? Look for the village, look at him! It, oh, just, just forget him, he's like that tall, we'll squash him later. Just do the review, forget about him. Oh, twat. So, um, Beetlejuice. Hawk! Hey, come on! You gotta work with me here! I'm just trying to cut a D! What do you want me to do? You bunch of losers! You're working with a professional here! Oh, nice. Real nice. Nice fucking model! Nice! Do you think he is Muggle Jackson grabbing his... Nice fucking shirt. The 80s called, they, they want that back, so... Well, you know, the 80s, like, the clothing is actually kind of back in style, back in fashion right now. Yeah. But Ni nice. Nice, fu nice. Nice fucking teeth. Nice. See that? Ginger virus. Fucking Real bad. Go to dentist. I'm a weirdo. Okay. Review. So, yeah, Beetlejuice. Anyway. Um, yeah, so the last time I watched this film was about seven years ago, which is really interesting. It'll probably be exactly seven years ago. Anyway, time is, is irrelevant. Um, I I find it strange that he's barely in the film and has such a such an impact. You know, uh, that's always interesting to me. But when, when he's on screen, he's on screen. It is such a committed performance. It there's there's not a semblance of of an actor who's hesitant about what he's doing. He fully commits. Apparently, there was a lot of improvising going on, like the bit where he just spits into his into his jacket. And they go, save the one for later. <laughs> Like that's uh, apparently it was just something he just came up with on the fly, and that character is just he, he comes in like a whirlwind and leaves an instant cinematic impression, and then he leaves almost as quickly as he arrived, you know, and you kind of forget that it's like it's like um you know uh, Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs, he's only in the movie for like twenty minutes. I think Vader's only in Star Wars for like fourteen minutes, something like that. But they have this impact, and their their presence is felt through most of the film. 
Um, but Winona Ryder does a lot of the kind of heavy lifting as far as the story is concerned in terms of like what her character does, which is it gives Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin something to kind of um, um, strive for in terms of, you know, they want to get these people out. I, I, you, you know the plot of the film. Young couple dies at the beginning and they, they, they're kind of working on their dream house and um, this, uh, what would you call them? They call them the yuppie ghost couple and trendy New Yorkers, they call the cup, the family who move in. And so they want to get these the, the New Yorkers out of their house because they're going to redecorate everything they've spent so much time working on. Even though they're dead, it's the principal of it. They don't want their home to be ruined, basically. And so they're trying to scare these people from, from their house. And the, their daughter, Lydia, who's this kind of goth kind of girl, can see them, you know. And uh, the handbook for the recently deceased says that, you know, certain people can see people who are dead um, and it's all about the strange and unusual or something and it's that line where she says I myself am strange and unusual and so she can see the ghosts and and it kind of they form a weird like little family unit which from my memory it's like a really sweet kind of touching thing where Lydia almost finds like the parents she wishes that she's had that she's never had in in Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin but when you watch the film again they, they don't have that many scenes together and it's this bond that forms very quickly and i think that speaks to the performances because they really sell it in the short time that they have together there's not many scenes those three characters have together i don't think and so i really like how that plays out it just um i get involved in it and i i, I kind of want them to have this weird ghostly family unit by the end of the film which of course they end up doing which is a really satisfying ending to the, to the story uh they did talk very much about doing a sequel to this beetlejuice goes hawaiian i think I'm so glad it didn't happen. I think this film stands as, I'm going to say it, a masterpiece. I know people probably don't look at this film very fondly in terms of it being just the film that it is. I think people enjoy it as a kind of wacky, you know, Tim Burton movie. But I think it's a genuine masterpiece because it it, this, it stirs so much up in terms of, again, the music. It's a very haunting film, even though it, it's, it's very much a comedy. And it's really fucking funny. And, you know, I forget the actress's name who plays the mother. You know, she's in Home Alone and she's so funny. And she's, I'd never appreciated the the real comedy of her performance until watching it this time. Even though I've seen the film probably dozens of times as an adult now, as a, as a, a full proper adult in my 30s, I really appreciate what she's trying to do with that performance. It's so funny. Um, Winona Ryder is great. You know, Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin are really good. Um, you know, kind of bland characters, but they play it so sincerely and down the line that you really get behind them. And then Michael Keaton just seals it all together. And the guy who played Otho is really memorable as well. Um, yeah, I, and I just oh, and Sylvia Sidney. Oh my God, just the kind of the kind of grouchy kind of you know. It always bothers me that she she got that kind of slit in her neck. <laughs> Where she smokes and the smoke starts coming, it's just disgusting. I always gonna, I can't not look at it though. It's one of those weird things. Um, the the music when they come back into their house after a few months and they see that everything's been redecorated and the, that music cue that is used throughout the film, the kind of dun, dun, I can't do it. You, you won't even catch what I was trying to you know, convey there. But that that piece of music, I don't know. I just and the visuals. Okay, so four K. The, the, the kind of clarity on this and the kind of the texture of the grain, which is really what you're going to get with more resolution and stuff. But even the colors, I will say, now that we can actually see what HDR can do, there's a lot of, the colors are great in the film. There's a lot of bright colors and it's very vivid at times. Lots of um, moments where characters are seeing things with green lights in the afterlife or blue light. And really, I'd really forgotten how colorful this was. And when I was considering buying this, I thought, well, Beetlejuice isn't a very colorful film. It's all dark and kind of, you know, kind of ghostly stuff. But no, it's a super colorful film and it really benefits from that. But mainly the added resolution and the grain, it just looks great. And it and it, it kind of shows you even more of the detailing on some of the incredible um, practical effects in this film from like when, you know, Gina and Alec, they kind of pull their faces into weird things to kind of scare, the, to scare them. Even like the... the okay, this is interesting because... Um, there's there's two ways that the, the special effects in this film have aged in terms of looking at it on a 4K disc. So, number one, um, there's the... Well, I'm not going to go through everything, but one thing that really has aged well is when they first try and scare the couple, the family who move in and Gina Davis is, like, holding Alec Baldwin's head, like, with the knife. And you see it, you know, it's, it's Alec Baldwin's head and he's speaking. It's so well done, the way that they kind of 
put his head into the frame there with like the the kind of the neck that's been cut off was fantastic held up so well and I, I am remembering now that my, I think my mum did show me this because I remember that scene when she's holding the head and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And my mum thought it was hilarious, right? And so I was like, wow, this is like a really adult film, but it's, I guess it's okay. I don't know. Um, and uh, and I think, again, it, it goes back to the Aliens connection for me, where I love Aliens so much as a film, but also my connection to my mum that I have with it because she showed it to me when I was young. And uh, and she looks a little bit like Sigourney Weaver. And I will say that the hair she had when I was very young was very similar to Gina Davis's hair. It was the very dark, curly. And so I kind of saw a bit of my mum in Gina Davis when I watched it as a kid. I didn't really think about it when I watched it this time. Anyway, one thing that didn't hold up special effects wise was the very end of the film, the final kind of um, little epilogue joke where um, Beetlejuice is in the waiting room. And he switches the numbers with the, you know, the the voodoo guy who sprinkles some dust in his head and his head just begins to shrink. And uh, it's all done in kind of this one shot where the head just gets really small. And it's really cool and funny and then his voice gets pitched up and stuff. It looks abysmal. It looks so bad. You can see the, the janky kind of like matte lines. They, it's, it's not refined at all. It looks terrible. <laughs> and it's fine. You can go along with the, the humor of the scene. But that's one instance where the 4K really revealed the kind of limitation of that particular effect. But there's so much that holds up. Like the stop motion that, that gets thrown into there. Um... The sets, you know, you get more detail in the sets and things. And uh, and again, the practical stuff, but particularly in the waiting room with all the weird... And I'd never noticed this before, and it's not because of the 4K. I just never really clocked it. But obviously, all the people in that waiting room are there in the various ways in which they died. And so I, I love that guy who's just this little... <laughs> He's like this little tiny body that's black and charred. And he just said, you want to smoke? I'm trying to cut back myself. <laughs> Fucking brilliant. And then you get the woman who's like kind of cut in half, who was clearly like a magician's assistant gone wrong. But like in the background, you, you see this guy just hanging on the wall um, in a sleeping bag with a rattlesnake. <laughs> I'd never noticed that before. And obviously you got the guy who kind of comes in on the wire. You know, how you feeling? Feeling a little flat myself. <laughs> Been run over by a car. So the, I love all those. It's very, the, the, the humor is very dark. It's a very, it's a black comedy. You know, it's very much dealing with death and even suicide at one point very flippantly there's a moment where Lydia writes a suicide note and it's I'd always seen it as a very serious scene but watching it now it kind of plays off as kind of funny because it's just this you know it's it's the kind of um it's kind of the prototypical teenage angst moment you know as I'm gonna kill myself I am so alone you know and it's kind of it's a little bit humorous in a very dark way and uh, the woman at the the waiting room who's kind of cut her wrists and stuff, and it's kind of played off as a gag. <laughs> it is, <laughs> and the football team who don't realize that they're dead, and they're like, "Coach, <laughs> I'm not your coach." <laughs> it's, it's it's hilarious. And Michael Keaton, as I said, I can't praise him enough. He just disappears into that role. And they've been talking in recent years about doing a sequel. I'd love to see it for a what the hell, why not? But honestly, I hope they don't because this film just stands alone. And again, I call it a masterpiece earlier. I really feel like it is in terms of the imagination on display and, and just how unique it is, the way that it looks, the way that it sounds, the way that it feels. There's just, there's nothing else like it. And I feel like Tim Burton really just hit a huge creative peak um, around this time. I think with Beetlejuice... Batman, Edward Scissorhands, he's just firing on all cylinders in a very Tim Burton kind of way. And everything beyond that for me, there's been great films like Edward and, um, you know, other films that I enjoy. But I feel like he, he's never really reached that again. And that's fine. You know, it's, it's not to say that, you know, he needs to go back to what he did before. But those films stand for me. Uh, the test of time. And especially this one. I was really surprised by how well how well it did hold up. And there's just nothing about it I, d I dislike. I love everything about it. Definitely one of my favorite films. And the 4K experience, thankfully, was very good. And I did do a quick test with the Blu-ray. And the Blu-ray looks a lot brighter. And at first, I thought it was the HDR making everything look dark. But apparently, um, the Blu-ray master of Beetlejuice is kind of an old one. And it was uh, they brightened it a little bit. I don't know. But I thought it looked great for the most part. I really did love the way this looked. And it was it was just a nice kind of like seeing a film that you've always loved and it's been many years like seven years in this case 
and you, you, you kind of realize how much you love this film. It holds up, it's great, it's enjoyable, and you're seeing it in a premium format where you can see even more detail, and it's just, um, yeah, brilliant. Thumbs up all around on this 4K box set. Um, with the I love this packaging, the handbook for the recently deceased. And I love the artwork on the main Blu-ray as well, uh, the 4K disc. So, yeah, that's it. That's I've conquered this in terms of buying a new release and watching it straight away, even though it's a film I've seen before. But again, I'd like to expand this series. And I might even in the future not j just do single titles all the time. I might do, like, Conquering My Collection, Episode 20. Here's three films I watched. I don't know. Uh, that one might be easier. I don't know. I feel like doing single videos... Um, it, it makes me put it off more, you know, so that's kind of, that might be a problem, I don't know. Anyway, Beetlejuice, loved it, um, so many great memories of watching it when I was younger, and uh, hopefully more to come of watching this again and again, and, and having it in 4K is great, and I'm just repeating myself at this point, but um, there's just something special about it that I'm always going to love, and I was relieved and delighted to see that it more than held up, it actually turned out to be the most I've probably ever enjoyed it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Hey, right by me. <laughs> Apart from the fact he throws cans and calling into a tree. <laughs> yeah, he's really cool. Yeah, he's really cool. But he's not quite as cool as you. Cause...